yeah good evening good afternoon good morning i welcome you all to this uh, 96th webinar of the webinar series on spintronics uh, which we call as w2s i'm absolutely delighted and privileged to introduce professor olaf helbig today and i'm really grateful on behalf of my w2s team braj pushpendra sakti ajay soyang and others uh, and all, all also on behalf of the audience <coughs> uh, really our sincere thanks to uh, olaf for kindly agreeing and uh, going to give this lecture today we are very much looking forward to it i think uh, olaf elwick is a very well known name in the field of uh, nanomagnetism and spintronics so probably doesn't need uh, uh, a detailed introduction but nevertheless there are young students for their benefit i would like to say a few words about his career so oh, i personally know olaf uh, maybe about 20 years maybe time 19 years in 2003 i think he came to university of duisburg sn and gave a very nice talk i remember that was my phd days and uh, since then of course olaf has moved around and done excellent work in magnetism and spintronics so olaf uh, received his diploma in 1997 and phd in 2000 in physics uh, from ruhr university in bochum in germany also very close to duisburg and uh, then um, he moved to uh, i think different places his phd thesis was on the oxidation of epitaxial niobium films where he studied uh, oxygen and dissolution and oxide formation under the supervision of uh, professor harmut uh, sabel um, and since 2016 uh, professor ola welwick is a full professor of physics for magnetic functional materials at kemnitz university of technology in parallel He is also a group leader at the Helmholtz Center on Dresden uh, Rosendorf, uh, or known as uh, HJDR, in the Department of Magnetism and the Institute for Iron Beam Physics and Material Science in Dresden. Uh, after his PhD, he switched topics towards magnetism and spent about three years, between 2000 to 2003, as a postdoc at the IBM Almaden Research Center in San Jose, in California, under the supervision of Professor Eric Fullerton. who also gave a lecture in wbs uh, several weeks back <laughs> uh, where he was working on new magnetic thin film systems for hard disk drive applications then he uh, i think returned to germany in 2003 where uh, to bessi synchrotron facility where he was working as a senior scientist uh, bessi in berlin where he worked with professor stefan eisenbeck on pioneering x-ray spectroholography techniques for magnetic imaging and this was a real revolution around that time and i think he talked about that during his uh, lecture some 19 years ago uh, in 2005 he returned to san jose in california again and joined the research department of hitachi global storage technology as a scientific staff member working on bit pattern media development uh, for hard disk drives in 2012 uh, ola became the director and manager for heat assisted magnetic recording known as uh, hmr mr uh, media at the san jose center Uh, in western digital company in san jose where he led a group of about 10 scientists working on l10 order iron platinum based hma media uh, besides various scholarships during his student and phd time he has received the gold patent award at hitachi global storage technology and helmos distinguished professorship in 2016 as the hjdr so uh, as we can see he is having a very a uh, strong background of fundamental physics as well as really connected to the applications and uh, the today's talk would be exploring magnetic reversal behavior and domain structure in perpendicular and superpolar synthetic antiferromagnets so these are really timely topics and we are very much looking forward to your talk ola i just want to make a small announcement that during the lecture we don't take questions uh, in case anybody has a question you can kindly write your question in the chat box or raise your hand at the end of the lecture first we will take a group photo so i would request all of you to uh, turn on your camera for 30 seconds or so we take a photo and then we come back to the question and answer session so with this uh, i think i now hand over to olaf and looking forward to your lecture thank you so much yeah thank you very much so everyone can hear me well and see my pointer i hope yeah yeah yes okay 
So yes, uh, you heard the uh, the title already, and uh, I'm more talking about fundamental uh, physics here, magnet magnetic reversal. You see in the title, you see domain structure. So uh, similar as my former colleague Andreas Berger when he was giving the talk, I'm not in the close sense in the spintronic area here with this talk, but of course everything is very much related to spintronics, as you hopefully will see also in the talk. Okay. So with that, I want to show you quickly where I am. So I put a map down here from uh, Germany and the surrounding countries. And Chemnitz is actually here in the former eastern part of Germany, very close to Dresden. So you see here the little highway that I'm going back and forth from Chemnitz and Dresden. And Chemnitz has changed its uh, name again after the reunion from uh, of Germany. Uh, formerly, it was actually known as uh, Karl Marxstadt. And maybe you know it from uh, the famous James Bond movie Octopussy, which uh, actually plays partially in Karl Marx Stadt. And we still have this big uh, statue here or the head from Karl Marx here in the city center. And that's, uh, that's still remembering everyone that formerly it was called Karl Marx Stadt. The original name was Chemnitz, then uh, through former Eastern German times, it was called Karl Marx Stadt and then was renamed back after the reunion to uh, Chemnitz. And here I just put a photo from uh, of Dresden, which is very close by both cities uh, in, in Saxony. Okay, so that's where I am. And uh, I have a part of my labs I have here at the Technical University in Chemnitz and the uh, Institute of Physics. So that's here. And then I have to drive about 100 kilometers uh, to the other half of my group and half of my lab, which is at the Helmholtz Centrum Dresden Rossendorf, which is a little bit past Dresden um, and uh, which has uh, a, it's a, it's a large scale facility in Germany and has some large scale uh, user facilities also. I will get to those in a second. We have also a new uh, center here at the Technical University in Chemnitz. It's called Main. It's called the Center for Materials, Architectures and Integration of Nanomembranes. And we also got a few labs in that center, which is an interdisciplinary center that should bring physicists, chemists and engineers together and material science uh, for collaboration. So I have about 10 people here at the TU Chemnitz and then about six people at the Helmholtz Centrum and we're working in very close collaboration. Okay, let me show you quickly some pictures from Chemnitz. This was uh, the last graduation here in Chemnitz. You see, this is the main building of the university. So it's very old part of the university and Chemnitz uh, just a few years ago, five years ago, celebrated its 180th um, the birthday of the technical university. So it was founded already in 1836. Here you see the corresponding celebrations on the Opera Square uh, in Chemnitz. And when you look at the university, we have, as I said, we have some old buildings, the old campus, and then we have a very modern and new campus. Here you see the lecture building, and this is here the mechanical engineering building. Here is the, uh, the cafeteria. So, so a lot of connection in Chemnitz um, between old and new. And uh, finally, I want to point out that Chemnitz was just last year uh, elected the uh, capital, the cultural capital of Europe for 2025. So there will be lots of international activities here in Chemnitz in 2025. And it becomes for one year, uh, the cultural center of Europe, uh, together with uh, one other city of Europe. And you can see here the town center, the city center. And maybe the last thing I want to mention is that Chemnitz is very famous for its Christmas market. And in the winter, it has the largest Christmas market in Saxony. Okay, I one more slide on hard set the air. So the Helmholtz Center Dresden Rosendorf is a large uh, research center. It has a total of 1,200 employees and uh, PhD students. You see here uh, from the air, all the buildings. It has three large scale facilities where you can also apply for, uh, for, um, for, for time, experimental time. It has a, a accelerator, a Elbe accelerator here, a particle accelerator where you can use all kinds of uh, radiation for material characterization and modification. We have a magnetic height field lab where we can uh, expose samples to very high magnetic field pulses up to several, about 60 or even up to 100 Tesla pulses. And then we have the ion beam center where we can uh, irradiate and uh, modify materials and also characterize them with all kinds of uh, different ions. Uh, and then you see here the two buildings where uh, I have the labs of my group here, the magnetic functional materials 
group. Okay, and with that, I come to the outline uh, of my talk. So I want to give you a brief uh, motivation and introduction and then talk um, a little bit about perpendicular magnetic anisotropy in magnetic multilayer systems. Um, specifically talk a little bit about the difference between in-plane and out-of-plane synthetic antiferromagnets. So we make a multilayer system and then we introduce some, some antiferromagnetism to this multilayer system. And uh, then um, while synthetic antiferromagnets are already very much used in various applications, I want to focus here on a uh, aspect that has maybe not so much looked at, which is collective effects in SIFs uh, with dominating antiferromagnetic exchange. So when we have more than four blocks, often in applications, you have only two blocks, but I'll get to that in the motivation introduction. And then I want to compare the synthetic systems with intrinsic antiferromagnets, where the antiferromagnetic order originates from the atomic arrangement uh, in the crystal structure. And then I'll, I'll point out some crucial differences between the intrinsic system and the synthetic system. And we will see from that, that when we, when we, we can very much tune the energetics in the synthetic systems, because they are based uh, on the thicknesses of the individual layers in the system. And you will see that we can create different scenarios there. One scenario here is uh, the dominating antiferromagnetic exchange. And you will see that we then get uh, what is called the surface spin flop. And with that, I want to show how you can control antiferromagnetic domain walls in synthetic antiferromagnets. And we can also reduce the antiferromagnetic energy then further uh, to compete with other energy terms like the anisotropy energy and the demagnetization energy. You will see that you then get a complex reversal um, of mixed ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic domains. And uh, finally, we want to uh, see if we can control also on a nanometer length scale the energetics in the system to create laterally coexisting ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic mixed regions. And we use for that actually one of the large scale facilities that I just introduced from HZTR, the ion beam center. And for that we can actually create the custom designed stray field magnonic and also magneto resistance landscapes from the synthetic antiferromagnets. Okay, so SRFs, synthetic antiferromagnets, are already or have been already used in devices for quite a long time. I just want to show here some uh, pro, uh, some prominent examples. For example, in spin valves uh, for for MRAM and also for uh, magnetic recording heads, often the uh, fixed layer, the pinned layer in a spin valve. Uh, was uh, or consisted of a synthetic in-plane antiferromagnet uh, in order to compensate also the stray fields uh, from the fixed layer and not have any parasitic stray fields uh, on the free layer. That way the fixed layer by itself has a closed flux uh, a loop here in, a, in such a, a nano device. And that way we have less disturbance of the free layer and a better signal, uh, for example, in a retet when we try to uh, detect the stray fields from a hard disk drive. Also, uh, AF coupling and synthetic antiferromagnets were used in the transitional uh, time from longitudinal to perpendicular recording in hard disk drive. This was called AFC media, and that actually uh, brought a little bit um, relaxation to the perpendicular magnetic recording development, which had to solve a lot of problems. And this AFC media concept here uh, it could help actually to reduce signal to noise ratio in longitudinal media so that uh, the density could be increased be a little bit further before then perpendicular took over in about 2006. And then I just show here, I noticed that also you had Tiffany Santos as a guest speaker a while ago. She was actually one of the members in my team when I was working at, uh, at um, HGST, Western Digital Company, and she introduced also spin valves. And you can see that they also use cobalt platinum multilayer based SIFs in their uh, MRAM cells, actually. So I took that uh, from her IEEE Distinguished Lecturer talk that she also gave, I think, in this community here. Okay, apart from that, another motivation, I, I'm sure you, you saw this perspectives paper, Nature Perspectives paper uh, of uh, uh, famous people like Duane, uh, Lee, Parkin, and Stiles, and they advertised uh, synthetic antiferromagnets or synthetic antiferromagnetic spintronics uh, in this very short 
uh, paper here where they highlight advantages of SIF system for Spintronic applications. I just try to, to extract everything out of the paper here. What some advantages that they advertise is easy access to antiferromagnetic dynamics, of course, then magnetic field sensors, MRAM, I just showed that. In spin talk oscillators, they are used a lot. They are used also uh, for spin orbit talks. You can use them for spin wave manipulation. Since you have AF coupling, you would also get additional optical modes. Uh, they are often used, and we've done that ourselves for non reciprocal spin wave characteristics. Um, and then uh, I think Stuart Parkin published a paper like some years ago, where he shows that also domain wall motion in such synthetic antiferromagnets can be much faster than in ferromagnetic systems, and that that is an advantage for racetrack memories. And then for skirmion dynamics, you also saw in the last few years, a lot of systems where now antiferromagnetic skirmions in synthetic antiferromagnets are looked at. So um, here in this paper, both geometries in plane as SIFs and perpendicular SIFs are advertised. And then there is also a image in the paper which shows you that you can actually make real antiferromagnets, not just two blocks that are AF coupled, but multiple blocks that are AF coupled. And um, that, of course, interests us uh, in, this, in this talk here. And we want to go also perpendicular. So we want to actually... Um, go to the perpendicular geometry here and then we want to af couple multiple blocks here and also look for uh, collective effects one uh, important thing in these double multilayer structures where the blocks themselves are cobalt platinum multilayers and then some of the platinum layers are substituted by uh, interlayer exchange coupling materials like ruthenium or iridium that they are independent of the crystal structure and you can tune the energetics and the physics uh, by just changing individual thicknesses and number of repeats. And since we are interested in collective effects here, we want to look at, uh, at samples with n equal or larger than four. Okay, so let me quickly show you. I want to go back to my title and, and say what we want to look at here. So on the one hand, we want to look at the uh, magnetic reversal behavior. Uh, of the system, that means we want to um, be able to reverse the system and understand the specifics of the system. Here, I just show some examples how you get a block by block reversal in such AF coupled systems and how you can study it with MOOC. And here is now a system with, uh, with four blocks on the left side. On the right side, we have a system with 10 blocks. But I don't want to go into much detail here. I just want to use it as a placeholder here for the uh, reversal behavior that's very interesting in such system, especially when you get collective effects. And then the magnetic domain structure uh, can be also very interesting, especially when you allow the inter, uh, the antiferromagnetic interlayer exchange coupling to compete with other energy terms in the system. For example, a few uh, many years ago, we published some papers where we saw that there was a change in the domain wall structure between antiferromagnetic domains in such uh, synthetic antiferromagnets. And here you just see such a um, such a transition from a sharp domain wall where directly two antiferromagnetic antiphase domains touch each other to a uh, ferromagnetic, we call it tiger tail type of domain wall, where you have a ferromagnetic phase at the boundary between two antiferromagnetic domains, and you get very high stray fields here, uh, as, as shown here with this magnetic force microscopy image. And here we zoom out, and you can now see this one dimensional striped domain structure at the border between the two antiferromagnetic uh, domains in the system. And then you can get, of course, also get superposition of ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic domains. So in, in, in atomic antiferromagnets, uh, this is often very difficult because the antiferromagnetic exchange is dominating very much and the other energy terms uh, are much weaker. Okay, and then I want to discuss the second part of the title here, which is per, uh, perpendicular and isotropy layered synthetic antiferromagnets. So we want to make them perpendicular so that we have a uniaxial perpendicular anisotropy uh, easy access system. And then we want to work with layered structures. And here are some cross-sectional TM images where we show that almost on the monolayer precision, we can now sputter these systems for already a few decades. And you can see that even over many, many repeats, we can keep a very nice and uh, well-defined multilayer structure. Uh, they are synthetic, so they are not uh, natural or genuine, but artificially fabricated with full control over the desired properties, but only up to an order of magnitude thicker than their 
um, crystalline uh, intrinsic counterparts. And uh, antiferromagnets, actually, we're going to look here at fairly simple antiferromagnets, A-type antiferromagnets, so layered structures in just one dimension where we have the antiferromagnetism. Of course, when you go to crystalline and intrinsic structure, you can have much more complicated antiferromagnetic interactions. But here for the synthetic case, we stay with layered antiferromagnets. OK, so uh, here is another slide where I show now the material system that we are using. So um, I show here this double multilayer system. So as a basic, we use uh, cobalt, platinum, palladium, and sometimes you can also substitute platinum and palladium for nickel. So we will we'll layer those alternatingly with a few monolayers, and that gives us the perpendicular anisotropy in these blocks. And then we uh, periodically substitute uh, some of the platinum layers with either ruthenium or iridium, which both couple uh, at the right thickness, fairly strong antiferromagnetically, uh, the adjacent cobalt layers. And with that, these blocks, which act as, uh, as magnetic units here, as you can see in the magnetic structure of the system. And then all the magnetic energy terms here can be fully controlled by the individual thickness of the layers. So T cobalt, T whatever we're going to use here as the uh, other layering material to obtain perpendicular anisotropy. And also, also we can tune the antiferromagnetic uh, exchange strength. Uh, we can even switch it to ferromagnetic by tuning the thickness of the ruthenium and the iridium. And then, of course, we can also change the number of repeats X, which is the number of cobalt layers that we put in one block, and the number of N, which is the number of antiferromagnetically coupled blocks that we want to use. Okay, here is just a bigger scale uh, cross-sectional TEM image that shows you in this case here, uh, we have a 20 block uh, cobalt platinum ruthenium multilayer. So we have 20 ferromagnetic blocks that are uh, AF coupled by 19 uh, uh, iridium layers here. And in this uh, image, we got even a little lucky. We got some contrast, even though iridium and platinum are kind of right next to each other. In the uh, periodic table, we got uh, we can here see some contrast variation between the um, iridium and the platinum. You can see actually the the 19 iridium layers here in this image. While here in this image, you can see high, uh, um, you can see mainly the cobalt layers here over these um, many many layers, and you can see that we keep the layering quite nicely in these structures. They are all sputter deposited, so even with sputter deposition, this is uh, today of course impossible. Okay, so a couple of slides on perpendicular anisotropy as an introduction. So uh, of course it is not so easy to get perpendicular anisotropy system because the shape anisotropy of a thin film of course wants to have the uh, magnetization in the plane. So you can either use crystal uh, orientation and a very strong crystal anisotropy to overcome this big uh, DMAC energy or big DMAC field or you can layer the structures like in cobalt platinum multilayers, then you are independent of single crystal substrates and can just use silicon oxide substrates, glass or, or wafers with native silicon oxide, and you can orient the anisotropy perpendicular. So for that, you have to make the EKU, so this anisotropy from the layering, from the interfaces, you have to make it larger than the DMAC energy uh, that that wants to pull the uh, thin film in the plane. So that's why we use these cobalt platinum multilayer blocks because we want to have uniaxial out of plane uh, anisotropy. But both of the terms, the DMAC energy and the anisotropy, are both significant in size because as everyone knows, the thin film uh, geometry is basically the one where it's the hardest to pull the magnetization out of plane because the DMAC tensor is maximum in the out of plane direction of thin films. And that is also why in order to reduce the DMAC energy of a uniformly magnetized uh, perpendicular thin film with a lot of uh, poles here, um, the system splits up into striped domains. So, and because the energy gain here from decaying into striped domains and reducing the internal DMAC fields um, is, is very large, we have to get a very periodic striped domain structure. Here's a typical MFM image of such a striped domain structure. And with that, the, D, the out of plane DMAC term here is a little bit reduced because uh, now you can get flux closure um, stray fields here outside the film, and that reduces the DMAC energy uh, within the film here. 
So we take this system, which you can realize just by cobalt platinum or cobalt palladium multilayer. And when you make many repeats and you make the system rather thick, then you get this uh, typical hysteresis loop that's shown here. So it's not like then you have only very few repeats, you get a squared loop with the full uh, uh, full remanence. But when you make, uh, let's say, more than more than 10 or 20 repeats, then your integrated magnetic moment gets so large that you get always a split up into striped domains and you get an almost a zero uh, magnetization state of 50% uh, up, 50% down striped domains here. So you nucleate them here, then you get into this 50-50 state and then you, you drive them out of the system again. So and so we have this energy configuration here, and now we add antiferromagnetic exchange coupling um, to this um, scenario. And when we do that, and you look at the um, you look at the uh, energetics here, um, then you see as we introduced antiferromagnetic coupling in the longitudinal geometry that it actually uh, stabilizes uh, the uh, that it actually stabilizes uh, sta the DMAC fields and antiferromagnetic coupling stabilize each other. So you can see that each uh, of the domains here forms a little flux closure. Um, and that way also, uh, that was one reason why AFC media also worked so well. Uh, because in the plane, when you have longitudinal uh, magnetization, you can get actually get a supportive uh, energetics here in the sense that both want want to have such an AF coupled structure. In contrast, when you go to perpendicular geometry, we just said the film wants to split up into domains in order to reduce the big DMAC energy of a uniformly magnetized perpendicular film. But when you make an AF coupling structure, then you create more poles at the AF coupled interface here. And actually the DMAC energy acts against the AF coupling here. So here you get here you get AF coupling stabilizing existing domain structure, and here you have the AF coupling destabilizing the domain structure. The the DMAC energy actually wants to wants to form domains that are uh, pointing in the same direction, yeah, so that these additional poles at the AF coupling layer are avoided, and that means you have here a competition in this geometry between the antiferromagnetic exchange and the demagnetization energy, and that is of course interesting. When you have a competition, that means you can also play with that, especially since you can tune uh, everything so easily with the, via the thicknesses in synthetic antiferromagnets, and you can create uh, and can control structures that way. Okay, um, I just show here again a little bit of categorization of synthetic antiferromagnets on the uh, x-axis um, we have the longitudinal magnetic anisotropy and the perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. So we have here the two cases for the anisotropy. And then in the y-axis here, I plot the number of AF layers. And as you know from the publications, most people are looking at n equal to two systems. And in the beginning, a lot was looked at longitudinal magnetic anisotropy, but there's also many, many studies now on perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, synthetic antiferromagnets. And there is, uh, but, but there's quite few studies only when you make more than two repeats and when you look at collective effects. And that's where we want to look at today. So we want to look at that corner here where we have perpendicular magnetic anisotropy and then not just two repeats, but we want to also make a collective effects. That means where more than one layer at a time reacts to an external field. Okay, so here I just want to show uh, how, what is the case if we had an atomic layered antiferromagnet? So if we had really atomic rows, like a crystal structure, and we have alternating uh, alternating magnetization, so sheets of, uh, of atoms that are pointing up and down. In an atomic antiferromagnet here, we have then a larger, large antiferromagnetic uh, energy, antiferromagnetic exchange energy, and the anisotropy, and also the demagnetization energy that we discussed previously here, uh, are much smaller than the antiferromagnetic exchange. And we know that because um, it is very hard to switch antiferromagnets and to, come this, to overcome this antiferromagnetic exchange. Here are some experiments uh, that have been done also in our high field lab at HART ZDR. 
by another group. And we see that you need uh, several tens of Tesla in order to saturate uh, atomic antiferromagnets with the pulsed fields. They were able to do that here. And you see it's between 40 and 50 Tesla here, the x-axis, that you can uh, saturate these. So it's, it's quite hard to study uh, such layered antiferromagnets when they are based on uh, crystal phases here. And uh, they, uh, they are intrinsic. Also, it's hard to, to image the domain structure because there's no net moment, of course. And uh, there are some, of course, some, uh, some characterization techniques like linear dichroism, for example. Here's one of the early papers from 2001 from the Joe Stir group where they studied exchange bias and they were able with XMLD to image uh, the alignment of the antiferromagnetic axis in different domains. So you can play some tricks and see antiferromagnetic domains, but it is, is very hard. So uh, with the synthetic antiferromagnets, now when you look at the relative strength of the energy terms, we basically can make the antiferromagnetic exchange energy much smaller. And with that also the reversal fields uh, come into a range where we can look at it with superconducting magnets or with electromagnets. So we can now actually handle the system. And now you can see that the antiferromagnetic uh, interlayer exchange energy becomes comparable to the other energy terms, namely the anisotropy energy which makes our perpendicular anisotropy and then also the large uh, DMAC energy that we still have in this perpendicular um, arrangement. Okay, so I want to build up here a little uh, comparison and want to quickly go through it. So I give you a little overview before I go in detail for the different scenarios. But now as we can control with the individual layer thicknesses, um, the energetics here and we can make uh, for example the af coupling energy smaller with respect to the other energy terms we of course can also go to other energy scenarios where we now let the anisotropy dominate over the exchange or where we even make the interlayer exchange energy smaller than the anisotropy energy and smaller than the dmac energy uh, in out of plane direction so we have now uh, the possibility in synthetic antiferromagnets to play with these energy terms and create different scenarios. Okay, and we are interested to look at all of these three cases, basically where the uh, antiferromagnetic uh, interlay exchange energy is still dominating, but not very much larger than the other energy terms. Once where it is going below the uh, the anisotropy energy and once where it even goes below the DMAC energy. And I will show you what happens to the magnetic reversal mechanism and to the domain structure as we do that. Okay, and we want to do that, as I said before, we want to uh, we want to basically do that for collective systems or for systems that have more than just two layers um, here. So we keep in this first Example here, we keep the order of the different magnetic energy configurations with respect to their strength, but we reduce the antiferromagnetic exchange so much that the field reversal becomes accessible with conventional magnetic fields available in the lab. So in our lab, that's seven Tesla, and we are interested in collective effects. So um, the difference of intrinsic antiferromagnets based on, on crystal structure versus multilayered SIFs is we have a very well-defined structure in SIFs. So as it's shown here, we have usually no antiferromagnetic roughness at the surface. If you have a crystalline intrinsic antiferromagnet, like for example, in typical exchange bias system, you always have some step edges and, and steps on the surface, atomic steps. You have usually both polarities at an interface to a ferromagnet or to other systems. However, if we make a little bit bigger the system and make it a synthetic system, we can be very sure that we have a clean polarization at the, uh, at the surface of our systems. And of course, we have this tunability of all the energy terms via the individual um, layer thicknesses and number of repeats. Okay, so let's go to the system, which basically mimics the system of intrinsic antiferromagnets, but it scales it down now to fields because the antiferromagnetic uh, coupling energy is so much reduced that we can study the reversal in reasonable fields. And we do that here uh, in a system which has 21 blocks and 20 blocks. And what actually happens when you do such systems uh, is that you get a different behavior for even and odd number of blocks. And that is shown here in the system. 
And you can see uh, we show here the various states along the reversal. So uh, state number one is an antiferromagnetic state with the 20 uh, blocks. And here you see the corresponding uh, state with one extra block, yeah, 20 and 21. And what you see is I guide you a little bit through the reversal. So when you start here, let's say in state uh, or, or let's let's start in state one here in Raman. So we are in this antiferromagnetic state. And what you can see is because we have an odd number of layer, we have a net moment because we cannot be fully compensated if we have an odd number of layer. And you see also that the two surface layers here point into the same direction down. And what we get here with the first step into the state two, actually what it does is it completely inverts the antiferromagnetic structure. So now every block that was up is down and vice versa. And now the two blocks at the edge point parallel to the field. And you have basically this little hysteresis loop here in the center where you can now switch between the two antiferromagnetic states here. And that is very nice. And you're using, of course, this extra block that you have that is not compensated in the structure. And then you get what is called a bulk spin flop. That is where you flop the system into the field direction. And now you don't have 180 degrees anymore between adjacent blocks. And then you slowly in this process here, in this very gradual process, you slowly straighten out the, um, let me see where's the camera. So you have, you have uh, pointing like that, and then you straighten them out until saturation here from this initial spin flop state three into the uniformly magnetized state four. So this is for odd number of repeats. For even number of repeats, it gets even a little bit more complicated. Of course, in remanence, you have, again, an antiferromagnetic state. But now, when you start nucleating a domain wall into the system, because one of the surface blocks here becomes unhappy uh, with the Zeeman energy, so uh, we apply a field, a positive field, let's say positive is an up direction, then this down spin here at the top surface is only coupled on one side, not as all the bulk spins which are coupled on two sides, so it has only half the antiferromagnetic exchange energy. So this is a really a surface effect here, and that's why it's called the surface spin flop. What happens is that moment wants to go parallel to the field. And it can only do that by introducing an antiferromagnetic domain wall into the system, because on the other side, the block at the surface is already parallel to the field. So that's the difference between even and odd. So you, this is already pinned by the Zeeman field. And that way, what you create here in state three, and those are the little plateaus here, the extra plateaus, you create an antiferromagnetic domain wall through the whole system. So the two surface blocks are now parallel, but with an even number of layers, you can only achieve that by putting 180 degrees face slip into the system. And that means an antiferromagnetic domain wall as is shown here for state number three. And then from there, the system goes into the bulk spin flop state, similar as for a uh, odd number of N, and then you can straighten it out again into saturation. So first thing, what you get if you can make such clean antiferromagnets uh, with synthetic system is that you get a difference between even and odd uh, number of repeats and that you can use that to control antiferromagnetic domain walls in your systems, which is a quite an interesting approach. And we published that here in two recent papers where we, where we showed this. Um, of course, in, in intrinsic antiferromagnets, which are atomic, when you have steps, you never can quite tell if you have even a clean, even or odd number. And so that gets all a little bit mixed up in, anti, uh, in atomic antiferromagnets, as long as you cannot make atomically smooth interfaces, which is usually the case uh, for your systems. And I just show here how the surface spin flop looks like actually. So here we have one antiferromagnetic domains, let's say on one side. And when we go and put another domain on the other side and we have an even number, then we have to put a domain wall in between the system. And that's what we just saw for an even number of repeats. And the funny thing is you don't get any lateral heterogeneity in your system. So we try to take MFM images to see if we have uh, different domains in the system or something, even at, uh, at remanence, different AF states, but we don't get that in the system. So the system is laterally uniform in the state where the antiferromagnetic exchange dominates. And we have really a slice uh, or a sheet of an antiferromagnetic domain wall all over our sample in the center of the uh, uh, SRF stack here. And um, you see here the single 
the single domain AF state, and then you see here the surface spin flop state again. And you can, of course, here um, color code this a little bit to make it simpler, get rid of all the arrows. And one thing we want to do in the future is actually to look at perpendicular standing spin wave modes in such structures and see what does the uh, trapped antiferromagnetic domain wall do, for example, with dynamic modes in such systems. So that's something we would like to look at. And we're still fighting a little bit with getting lower damping in the systems to get better dynamic properties and, and reproduce them uh, with, uh, with lower damping. But uh, of course, the other thing is when you go back, uh, let's go back a little bit here. One problem is also that you have to apply quite high fields here in the order of half to one Tesla in order to get the surface spin flop state uh, stabilized. Yes, you see at remanence, when you take the field away, you're always in the AF state here which should by itself be interesting for dynamics. But of course, it would be nice if you could stabilize both states at the same time uh, at remanence. And that's something we looked at as well and that I want to look at now. So what we did is we, uh, because of the tunability of the system, we actually uh, reduced the anisotropy in the system um, in the middle of the stack where the domain wall is usually situated. So we basically lowered the energy for the domain wall in the center and said, maybe if we do that, and then we can uh, extend the plateau here, which is out at 0.5 to one Tesla and extend it all the way to remanence. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to take these steps and basically push it out uh, to the reverse fields. And here we you see this uh, same sample, but with a little bit uh, thinner cobalt and platinum uh, layers in the center blocks here, what we could do is the steps that are here left and right of remanence are now on one side of the remanence. And that means when we hear remanent, we have a domain wall trap in the system. So by engineering the anisotropy in each block here, we can still keep the surface spin flop reversal, but we can push out this step here all the way out to here. And you can see here, we can then switch from one surface spin flop state to the AF state. And we can, of course, go back, back to remanence and sit then at zero remanence here with the AF state. And we can go even a little bit further. Then we get the opposite surface spin flop state and have the opposite um, configuration and can also stabilize that at remanence. So basically, uh, we can stabilize four different states in remanence. Uh, we can have two AF states where we have, in principle, a single domain. And then we have two states with antiferromagnetic domain walls, and we can use them uh, for, uh, we can stabilize them and have four different stable uh, collective states. And we can look now at the dynamics, even in remanence, for the um, trapped domain wall and for the uniform AF state. Okay. I think I, I'm already a little bit here coming into time problems, but let me. Uh, let me quickly um, summarize this part here. So when we have the antiferromagnetic interlayer exchange dominating, we get a collective surface spin flop like effect for even n and we can use this in order to trap uh, extended antiferromagnetic domain walls into our synthetic antiferromagnets. These are non-collinear structures. That's very important. You see in the center of the antiferromagnetic domain wall, we have actually an in-plane alignment of the moments. Okay, when we go to the second case here where we have um, now we drop the energy uh, of the uh, antiferromagnetic interlay exchange coupling below the anisotropy, then a tilting and a surface spin flop is not possible anymore because now the anisotropy, the perpendicular anisotropy is dominating. And actually you can see how the reversal changes here from a surface spin flop to a domain dominated reversal. And this is shown in this little cartoon up here. So in now instead of that, the whole system laterally coherent answers with a surface spin flop, we get the nucleation of antiferromagnetic bubble domains. So if we come from saturation and the whole sample is saturated here uh, in, in let's say down direction. So let's start from here. Then we nucleate some antiferromagnetic bubbles into the system as shown here in this cartoon until the system gets into a antiferromagnetic state on this plateau, the bulk layers, except for that one missing surface layer, which again has only half the AF coupling. So that goes separately in this little loop. So that's when here the surface layer switches. So in this state here, we are on the plateau and then the surface layer switches and we get to the AF state at remanence. When we go to the opposite, 
uh, field, we then switch again first the surface field on the other side, where the surface layer is opposite to the external field that roughly happens at half of the bulk switching. We get another little loop here for the surface layer and then domains again, a mix of ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic stripe domains bring the system actually to saturation. That was actually looked at a long time ago when I was a postdoc with Eric Fullerton. We looked at that, uh, at, at this energy scenario and, and uh, also published a few papers with, which I have uh, listed here. Um, and then I wanna quickly go also to the last case where we now drop the antiferromagnetic exchange even below uh, the uh, demagnetization energy and what happens then. I showed earlier when I showed you the, uh, the two layer uh, AF structure, then the DMAC energy overcomes the AF coupling and we just get ferromagnetic stripe domains. So then the AF coupling is actually not really visible anymore in this out of plane loop because now it is the weakest energy term and uh, the system is driven by DMAC energy and the DMAC energy is stronger than the AF coupling. And that's why you get now ferromagnetic stripe domains rather than these antiferromagnetic stripe domains. So if you summarize, you can tune now the reversal from laterally correlated reversal and uh, laterally correlated remanent state through a vertically correlated reversal, because here you have vertical correlation you still have a laterally correlated remanent state to a stripe domain reversal where both the um, correlated reversal and the remanent state, they are both vertically correlated. And you see the corresponding hysteresis loops and reversal mechanisms. And when you look at the remanent domain structure, as mentioned before, here you have almost, oh, you have no domains in the system, it's uniform. And uh, normally, even for this middle case here, you get in the out of plane loop a uniform system. But if you in plane demagnetize the system, you can trap antiferromagnetic domains. And then you get this um, a precursor state to the ferromagnetism at antiferromagnetic domain walls, um, which is these ferromagnetic uh, one dimensional stripe domains here. So only when you trap artificially uh, anti phase antiferromagnetic domains, you get this precursor state here at the domain wall where the energetics is slightly changed and where you get slightly earlier transition. Um, um, towards uh, ferromagnetic stripe domains. And then these stripe domains can grow out into two dimensions. And then when you drop the antiferromagnetic layer energy even further, you get ferromagnetic stripe domain. First. Okay, so here it's summarized again from AF uniform to a mix of uh, AF domains um, with AF domain walls to this structure here with AF domains and ferromagnetic domain walls to fully ferromagnetic domains. But these are, of course, the structures that we looked at already some time ago. They, you don't find them in intrinsic atomic antiferromagnets. Okay, the last part of the talk, which I try to go through in, in five minutes here, is now we can make samples that have these structures by tuning the layers here, um, the thicknesses. But can we also, in an example, in a sample, um, locally change the energetics by focused ion beams on a nanometer length scale. And for that, we use a focused uh, ion beam uh, helium uh, neon microscope, and we want to destroy the layer structure at certain, or we want to roughen the, the layer structure. And with that change the magnetic energy terms here and see if we can actually combine structures like that in our system. For that, we can calculate depending on the, uh, energy that we give the ions, how deep they penetrate into our multilayer structure. And we're using here only samples with the four blocks. And we calculate here the damage or the displacement that we do at a certain depth. So you see here we have the surface and then we have this multilayer structure it's here pushed on the side. And then we get uh, at, at this energy here, 9 keV, we get maybe a very uniform uh, displacement all across the multilayer. And that's what we used for our um, structure. And of course, in order to quantify how much we reduce the different energy terms due to the ion beam irradiation, we did some uniform irradiation of our systems. So we, first we didn't take a focused ion beam, but we took uh, in the, in the um, ion beam center, we can also do a whole sample uniform irradiation. And we did that. And then we plotted how the different energy terms, here's the antiferromagnetic interlayer exchange coupling plotted. On the other side, the anisotropy 
uh, and the uh, magnetization as well. And we plot that versus the fluence of the ions at nine kilo uh, at nine kilo volts, uh, kilo electron volt, uh, because that's the most uniform irradiation for our system. And then you can see that. And I plotted here the fluence, which is normally uh, plotted uh, per centimeter squared, but it's actually uh, a little bit more illustrating when you plot it with ions per nanometer squared. Then 10 to the 14 is here one ion per nanometer squared, 10 and 100 ions per nanometer squared. And you can see that around 10 ions per nanometer, you really um, the anisotropy due to the layering of the cobalt platinum and also the antiferromagnetic coupling, they both drop quite a lot while the magnetization um, 2 pi m s squared, so the DMAC energy stays the same. So the magnetization is not reused, reduced by the ion beam irradiation, but of course the two interface dominated terms, the antiferromagnetic uh, exchange interaction and the anisotropy are both dropping and it happens uh, very steeply between 10 and 100 ions per nanometer squared. And while we did here different, different samples where we sputter deposited different thicknesses, we now can actually uh, also take one and the same sample, which has here a step loop because of the antiferromagnetic coupling and where the domain structure has two different AF domains and we can irradiate it here and uh, we can look and stop at certain fluences and look at the structure. And we see here, we still have the two AF domains similar as here, but we now also get this uh, ferromagnetic uh, domain wall size here at a certain irradiation dose. If we go even further, we can also go to stripe domains. And here, when we irradiate really a lot, we can destroy both the antiferromagnetic coupling and the perpendicular anisotropy, and we can go all the way to in-plane systems. And that's what's shown here on the other side of this color-coded map where we go from this four um, step reversal um, where the, still the out of plane axis is the easy axis to an in plane system where now the out of plane loop is the hard axis. And here we just have a uniformly in plane magnetized sample at the end. Okay, so we can do that now. And then we can, of course, go back to the focused ion beam. And now we can start writing antiferromagnetic domains into our systems. So here you see there's a square which has uh, one antiferromagnetic domain, and the background is the other one. We can also work at the energy uh, at the energy constellation where we get these, this, these tiger tails here at the edges. Or we can irradiate a little bit more, and then we get ferromagnetic stripe domains. So it's a it's very versatile and you can now create on a nanometer scale different types of uh, magnetic energy constellations. And then you can go in and create wedge samples like we did here where we go from, from one energetic scenario with five ions per nanometer squared to 10 ions per nanometer squared. And you can study how the energetics change and how the different domain structures evolve. And then you can, of course, start writing also uh, whatever you want into your structure. But notice that this is antiferromagnetic domain. So outside, we have one antiferromagnetic domain here, which is up, down, up, down. And the letters inside have the opposite antiferromagnetic uh, domain constellation, down, up, down, up. And we can control that also because the sputter deposition gives us a little gradient uh, inside the film. Um, so the system will always reverse from the same side because we have some growth induced asymmetries and those we can, uh, these also are opposite for the ion beam irradiated areas. And that's why one AF uh, domain gets stabilized in the irradiated areas and in the non irradiated area we have the opposite antiferromagnetic uh, constellation. Okay, last little bit I want to show is uh, what are these good for these structures? So we have two ideas. We want to make well-defined stray field landscapes for uh, guiding magnons. And the idea is that we can create stray field landscapes here. When we are AF coupled, there's no stray fields. Wherever we are ferromagnetically coupled, we have a lot of stray fields come out. And we think when we do a heterostructure where we have this ion beam irradiated SRFs and on top we put, for example, some magnonic system or maybe even below if we want to use YIC, for example, which has a very low damping. And then we imprint the stray fields onto the, uh, onto the magnonic layer and with that uh, create a spin wave intra infrastructure. The other idea is that we create magnetoresistance landscapes, um, and for that we want to, of course, do 
uh, want to probe here the magneto resistance, for example, of such strip lines, where we then can uh, actually introduce uh, different types of domain structures. So you can see here again what I showed earlier, and then we can, of course, now irradiate checkerboard patterns, for example, with different structures. And I, I show here one structure where we have outside now, we have, let's say, one AF uh, structure of the system. And then we have the opposite AF structure here in these squares, and then we irradiate it a little bit more in the squares where you can see now the ferromagnetic stripe domains. And um, of course, we also looked at reversal movies, but in that case here, yeah, I don't have enough time to show you some reversal movies, but you get interesting remanent states and you can now with the ion beams tune the magnetic phase that you want to have in a, um, let's say several hundred nanometer size uh, area. And of course, when you irradiate more, you can also uh, have a coexistence of anti-ferromagnetic domains and in-plane structures. So here, the bright contrast is one AF domain, the very dark contrast is the other AF domain. And then you have here intermediate squares, which are in-plane magnetized because they got a very high fluence uh, of, the, uh, of the ions. And with that, you destroyed both the uh, cobalt platinum multilayer structure, which gives you the perpendicular anisotropy and also the AF coupling um, due to the ruthenium and iridium layers. Okay, with that, I would like to summarize. So, um, fully layer thickness controlled perpendicular magnetic anisotropy SIFs based on double multilayer systems are interesting. And we are focusing here on collective reversal effects and tuning the competition between antiferromagnetic exchange and demagnetization energy in these systems. And I showed you a few examples um, how you can tune the systems. On the one hand, you can get control over antiferromagnetic domain walls, and you can use them, for example, for looking at dynamics of such states where you have a trapped antiferromagnetic domain wall or not. Um, this is basically induced uh, by the surface spin flop. And then when we reduce the antiferromagnetic exchange below the other energy terms, first below the ani uh, anisotropy energy and then below the uh, demagnetization energy, we get a uh, reversal driven by laterally mixed ferromagnetic antiferromagnetic domains. And when we drop it even further to ferromagnetic domains and these different states can not only be created in different samples, but we can also take a sample with a relatively strong AF coupling and strong perpendicular anisotropy. And then on a nanometer scale with, with focused ion beam irradiation, we can custom design stray field uh, landscapes or different phases that coexist within one and the same sample. And those can be potentially used for magnonic or magnetoresistive landscapes. Uh, I just added here another idea that came to my mind when I looked at the recent literature and also at some of the talks that were given before on this platform. Of course, there's also a drive towards neuromorphic and other unconventional computing schemes where you maybe use uh, either magnetoresistive or also uh, uh, magnonic landscapes to process, uh, to neuromorphically process information analysis or data analysis. And for that, such systems could also be potentially quite interesting due to their complexity and nonlinearity. So with that, I would like to quickly uh, highlight my group here. So you see, uh, this was uh, our uh, our social event here last year. Um, so you see the main contributors to the uh, physics I showed you was uh, Ruslan Salikov here, uh, Benny Böhm and uh, Fabian Samad. Okay, and with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions and discussion. All right, thank you so much for this excellent uh, talk. On behalf of everyone, I thank you. I think I have to tell you one thing today, uh, my group is celebrating our 12 years of our laboratory at NICER and I think it could not be better without your talk today. <laughs> so thank you very much for making this really special. So before we take some questions, uh, I would uh, request Olaf to uh, stop sharing for a second. And I request yeah. all of you to turn on your camera so that we can take some kind of good photo. So please switch on your camera and smile when I say, and keep smiling and <laughs> keep taking pictures. 
All right. Okay, so please look at the camera. Cheers. Okay, one more, we have some more people. All right, all right, thank you so much. So you may kindly turn off your videos. And Olaf, you please uh, share your screen. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. So I think we can start. I already see some questions in the chat box uh, from one of my PhD students who is working on synthetic antiferromagnets. Yeah. Uh, he writes, while calculating the antiferromagnetic exchange coupling energy, uh, J exchange equal to H exchange into MS into T, where T is the thickness of the ferromagnetic layer. But it is uh, which ferromagnetic layer? The whole ferromagnetic layer thickness? Or the, the whole, thickness yeah. Of it's Only it's the whole, yeah. <laughs> It is in that case, the whole block, maybe I'll go quickly. Let me also set aside. It's the whole block. Uh, let me go here. Can I go back? Yeah. Okay. So if I go, I oh, know this is the wrong direction. Let me go back to, um, so yeah, it's, it's the whole block. So we basically, that's why I showed at the beginning, the structure of the system that we're using. And uh, you see, and almost there. Here. So these are really, you can consider them as blocks with the uniform magnetization, MS, and with the uniform anisotropy. So for, for the magnetic properties here, you use the thickness of, uh, of the um, of the whole block. And that is, of course, also as you increase, as you use more cobalt layers, for example, you can also, of course, tune the relative strength of the DMAC energy versus the AF coupling energy, because the thicker you make it with the more repeats, uh, the, the weaker, of course, gets the relative uh, strength of the antiferromagnetic interlayer exchange uh, in the system. So you can either tune the thickness by changing the inter uh, antiferromagnetic interlayer exchange um, um, by changing the thickness of the iridium or the ruthenium, or you can keep that constant and just work at the maximum and then increase the number of blocks X in your system to change the relative strength of the different energy terms. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe he has a doubt uh, in the sense uh, you have this uh, ruthenium or iridium special layer and you have some blocks below and some blocks above. So when you want to calculate this uh, thickness, so you take actually uh, which thickness, the, uh, the block on top or the block on below, or, or it is the summation of or both blocks? Um, well, normally, well, all the bulk, all the bulk layers have two neighbors, right? That they're AF coupled to, and only the surfaces have only one, one neighbor. Yeah, so um, we get for the, for the inner blocks, we get twice the antiferromagnetic uh, energy as for the surface blocks. But otherwise, I take the thickness of one block with the effective MS that I calculate uh, from a multi-layer without any AF coupling, right? Okay. So and then the thickness of the total block, yeah. Yeah. So the thickness is basically the total sample thickness, isn't it? For the DMAC energy, yes. For the DMAC energy, yes. But the AF coupling is, of course, only of one block. Okay. Because you have many AF coupling layers, right? I mean. Yeah, I think it's clear. Thank you. Uh, Sati, if it's not clear, you can ask or write again. Uh, his next question is very general, of course. Uh, why in most of the cases, only ruthenium, iridium, or rhodium are used as special layer and not other metals of same group in the periodic table? Well, that, that, that has to do, of course, with the... Uh with the quantum mechanical box that we create when we put such a layer in between two ferromagnetic layers, right? And also with the band structure of the, uh, of the, of the system. And then of course, the next thing is that you have to also keep in mind how well does the system grow on top of each other and how little interdiffusion do you get and how clean are the interfaces, right? I think Stuart Parkin, uh, published in the early days uh, where he went through the whole periodic table or through all the 3D elements 
and uh, and discussed how strong the antiferromagnetic interlayer exchange can be for various elements. Usually, it's here with cobalt. Of course, when you when you change cobalt for something else, you also might get different values because you change the band structure of one of your of your systems here. Uh, so that that really, uh, when you have clean interfaces, you have to quantum mechanically calculate. But of course, when you have a different roughness, that can be modified by that as well. And there are lots of papers from the early days when Ferd and Greenberg actually discovered interlayer exchange coupling and then people actually mapped out and uh, ruthenium iridium uh, in, with, in combination with cobalt supply some of the strongest antiferromagnetic coupling uh, of the elements. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Armin, I think you have a question. Please unmute and ask. Yeah. So my question is, I think you have uh, shared a uh, lot. Uh, I think Helmut probably is doing that, as you said. So what exactly in that magnetic medium, what exactly the aim of this antiferromagnetic layer at the bottom, uh, how it is going to uh, control the... Uh, let me quickly go back to my... Why can't I... I'm just wondering why. I, ah, okay, yeah, I can. Um, so the idea is actually that um, uh, that you uh, create a stray field landscape, and that usually the magnetic layers are very soft. Yeah, and they will be, they will copy, they will copy the stray field landscape um, in your that you supply by the synthetic antiferromagnet. And if you, for example, have a sharp domain wall between two antiferromagnetic domains, then you may be able to, uh, to pull the uh, magnetization of your magnonic layer into a preferred direction to, for example, get a demon Eschbach type of surface wave. Yeah. And then you can create a channel along the domain wall above in your in your let's say uh in your magnonic layer here you can create an artificial channel uh, you have seen the publications here where people channel magnons through domain walls now you can do that in a hybrid structure where you can reprogram so to say the uh you can reprogram for example the synthetic antiferromagnet by multiple um states that you have in remanents and then you can reprogram what the uh, magnonic layer sees and you can maybe reprogram the direction of the domain wall so we have written a patent on that um which is not yet uh, approved but uh, the idea is that you get reprogrammable um domain walls and uh, boundaries between domains that get copied from the synthetic antiferromagnet in the magnonic layer because usually these materials that we use here for the synthetic antiferromagnets have not very good damping so you don't get spin waves in the materials themselves so that's why you want to copy the stray fields into something that has very good magnonic properties and then it gives you the additional advantage that you if you have multiple remanent states in your srf and you can by an external field you can switch from one remanent state to another one that you can reprogram these stray field landscapes that the magnonic layer sees and with that you can reprogram the functionality of the magnonic layer okay the final question is so this uh, soft layer is directly placed on top of your saf or you can do it the other way around if you want to use yik you could grow your synthetic antiferromagnet on top of yik of course right i think there was recently a nice paper by another uh, roommate of mine sebastian van dyken where he put a cobalt iron boron film on top of yik and he also used the stray fields of the cobalt iron boron. This is a very similar idea. And he could show that he can create channels similar as the domain walls that were used in these Landau patterns. And he can make a channel for a, uh, for a magnon. And then he can even uh, turn the magnon around the curve, which is always a challenge, right? To make a 90 degree curve and put uh, effectively a magnon around the corner. And I think he showed very recently that that works. And he just uses there basically of a lithographically fabricated bar of, of, of cobalt iron boron he uses and that acts on a, a yik layer that is below. So this is of course the, the synthetic antiferromagnet would give you a lot of more flexibility with the uh, ion beam irradiation. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks. Really thanks uh, uh, there is a question by uh, Somerat from Japan. How did you measure to confirm the prepared samples are having PMA? So very basic question. Sorry? How you know that your samples are PMA? I think that's what you want to know. You just um, measure. 
Yeah, well, here you see here you see the original state of the sample, and you see the easy access loop, and then you see also the hard access loop, right? Yeah. And then it's flipped here on the other side. So now the uh, out of plane loop is the hard access loop, and and here, of course, besides the lower saturation field, you still have the AF coupling also on it. That's why you get the four separate reversals of the four blocks, right? So you just measure in and out of plain loop, of course, and but then you can also, uh, of course, use even when you irradiate, you still get the strong contrast of perpendicular stripe domains in between, right? Which you would also never get with uh, uh, with in plane domains or anything. So we know that our cobalt platinum multilayers uh, are out of plane, and we of course measure also always the in plane loops of these systems. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one question by Brinda, one another student from my group. Uh, in case of weakly antiferromagnetic interlayer uh, uh, coupled perpendicular magnetic MS to be subs, is there any role of IDMI to stabilize the stripe domains? If yes, are those domains chiral in nature? Here, I don't use DMI at all, at least not on purpose. Everyone claims there is maybe a little bit of DMI in cobalt platinum multilayers because cobalt doesn't grow on platinum like platinum grows on cobalt. And but for for us here it doesn't play a role. We are planning to combine it with DMI in the future, but uh, we haven't done so far. So we have no indication of a significant DMI in the system that influences uh, what I told you uh, at this point. Thanks. Uh, I have uh, two questions. First one: this uh, ion beam induced uh, modification of the domains in the pattern structure, which you showed towards the end of the lecture. Yeah. Uh, at, at different uh, regions, actually, like this one, you have different coupling uh, because of the uh, more or less ion implantation. I wonder, so you, you do a selective area ion implantation with some mass, yeah. or how did you do it? So there is a beam, and the beam on the, well, it's actually shown on one of the previous slides when I started here. So so the beam is 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 very well defined at the surface. Actually, there is only three atoms at the tip here that take put out the ions. So you have really at the surface, you have really a few nanometers beam, beam diameter. Okay. But when you go into the material because of the scattering and because of the uh, of the uh, because of the scattering and the displacement processes that happen, here is a shown a module uh, simulation for helium and for gallium. And we use helium here because it stays more confined. Yeah, so you get a higher resolution, and the resolution is usually, a, I would say, it's about 20, 30 nanometers. I would say is the resolution. So you can see in this structure that I showed before here. Um, I mean, this these domains here are about 100 nanometers. So our resolution is about 20 nanometers. So we can really write these these squares very sharply in, on that length scale. Yeah. Okay. This makes sense. Thanks. And my second question is, you may kindly reveal now where exactly you are, in Chemnitz or in Rosendorf? Sorry? Where are you now? In Rosendorf or in Chemnitz? I'm in Chemnitz. I'm in okay. Chemnitz. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So I don't see more questions. So I think it was a really fantastic lecture with such nice overview on synthetic antiferromagnets. Uh, so we are also working on fermions with synthetic antiferromagnets. And uh, I will send you some papers. And uh, I think your talk was very helpful for groups like us and for young researchers. Thank you very much, Olaf. So yeah. you may kindly stop sharing. I like to share my screen to okay. present a small memento. OK, so. Do you see my screen now? Ah, yes, I see it now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, it's really uh, my great pleasure to present this digital memento laugh. Uh, I, I hope uh, sooner or later in your future, you can come to our institute. We can uh, really host you well, and uh, we are looking forward to that opportunity. But until then, I like to thank you on behalf of my uh, W2S team. Uh, I will read this memento for you. W2S seminar webinar series on Spintronics, National Institute of Science, Education and Research, Bhubaneswar, India. Takes pleasure in presenting this plaque to Professor Olaf Helby from Chemnitz University of Technology and Helmholtz Centrum, Dresden, Rosendorf. 
in the cognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on exploring magnetic reversal behavior and domain structure in perpendicular anisotropy layer synthetic antiferromagnets. So thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Olaf, for this excellent lecture. I think on behalf of everyone, again, I thank you for your very, very nice uh, talk, uh, very clear. And uh, so I have to announce that we are taking a, uh, a break of a couple of weeks and I will probably resume this activity again in September. I will send information about that. Until then, please stay healthy, happy, yeah. and, uh, and see you next time. Thank you, Olaf. Yeah. yeah, thanks everyone for staying so late in India and attending the talk. Thank yes, you. it yeah. was a pleasure. Thank you, Olaf. Okay. Have a nice thanks evening. everyone, yeah. Bye-bye. Take care. See you all.